And, and um, let's, um, let's look at the prodigal son tonight, Luke 15. And, um, uh, you know, in, when I was in Ireland, I shared quite a bit, didn't I, on prodigal son. And <clears throat> I, I felt like it was the Lord. And, um, and over the years, I've shared a lot. But I still feel like there is um, a lot here that could really impact our lives if we get it beyond the story that we're familiar with and that's to me that's always an issue is that we um, we have to throw down our um, prior understandings of certain or well of all the scriptures and ask the Holy Spirit to talk to us you know to speak to us to to reach us really I mean you know um, and <clears throat> because we don't, we don't want to just be touched by the Holy Spirit. We want to be reached with Christ, with Christ crucified by the Holy Spirit. And we want to, we want to see exactly what it is that um, it is trying to declare from God's point of view. And uh, most of you know that the prodigal son story is pretty much generally understood to be a story of salvation and, um, uh, you know, repentance and stuff like that. <clears throat> and we, we see it in a different way. But tonight, um, when, we go, when we read it, let's just start with asking the Holy Spirit to give us all some, some insights. Um, and some things to be able to chew on because it's a simple story it's not like it's you know complicated or whatever so that we can carry that with us you know thy word have i hid in my heart uh david said and uh you know to to take that simple story and we can carry that with us when we don't have a bible when we're on the job when we're doing things you know around the house or whatever <clears throat> so let's just pray first. Father, we just come and we ask that the Holy Spirit, who uh, desi the one who desires to reveal Christ in us, the one who was sent according to Jesus' words to reveal him and to make known the things that are of him. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, to glorify him, to magnify him, and to pull back the veil that is over our eyes of part of that veil is a veil of ignorance and part of that veil is a veil of 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 already thinking we comprehend the bible when you can you can continually speak and show us newness of life and and as jesus said behold i make all things new so, Lord, make all, make all of these verses new to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you ready with a new mindset? <clears throat> all right. Um, and he said, a certain man had two sons. Okay, so two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him and when he came to himself he said how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him father 
I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Um, <clears throat> so let's just start with that. Uh, clearly, this is not a sinner. This is not somebody outside of the family. This represents a father and his sons. And we draw from this our heavenly father and the relationship that he wants us to come into, um, a relationship that's according to his heart. And um, I'm going to read a little sentence here that I wrote um, this afternoon, actually. <clears throat> the father has a particular view of his son that he wants formed in us. Okay, so there's actually two angles to that, and that is to gain his view and to gain his son formed after the way the father sees Jesus in us. The way, the way the Father sees Jesus, but that's Jesus in us. Does that, am I clear on that? Because <clears throat> he's not just, it's not just to formulate a understanding of the Father's view of Christ. It is to gain it, and then after we gain his view, to receive that as who the Son is in us. Now, that's a big deal, actually. I mean, isn't it? To, I mean, <clears throat> I think a whole lot of people are trying to um, get Christ formed in them, and they haven't gained the Father's view of the, what, the, what the Son looks like, what the, what the Son is supposed to be in us. <clears throat> and so I think that we kind of see that in verse 11 and, you know, with the younger son, the prodigal son. Um, and the father had two sons, and they were sons, meaning they were in the family already. And if you know the rest of the story, which you all do and should, but the elder son had his issues and the younger son had his issues and neither son had the father's view or the father's son formed in them. I'm talking about Jesus, the way the father sees him, the way the father knows him, the way the father knows the son that is in them. Do you, do you see that? The way the father knows the son that is in the prodigal and in the elder son. Because that's what, new birth is what brought him into the family, right? When you're born again, you're born again of incorruptible seed. And that's Christ. So we all have the son in us. That's not, there's no question about that. Um, and not only that, if you really think about it, we have the Son in the fullness of the view of the Father, but we don't know the Father's view. Therefore, we don't know that Son. Therefore, we, we sort of, we, we, we look at him religiously, you know. Um, we would say, uh, you know, our... I want to know the Son of God. You know what I mean? And the Father wouldn't say, you know, I, I want you to know the Son of God. He doesn't, he says, I want you to know my Son. <laughs> I mean, it's a completely, it's a, a non-religious <laughs> view that God isn't trying to get us to accept a religion. He's trying to get his Son formed in us based on his understanding or how he sees that son. And <clears throat> so the first step then would be to, um, to see 
you could say ourselves because we're one with the son that's in us. New birth settled that. That's the oneness is done. The recognition of oneness, the security of oneness, the blessing of oneness, the freedom of oneness, maybe we don't have all of that. Maybe we still view ourselves as, you know, um, someone could sit here in this room and they could say, well, you know, I don't, I don't have Jesus the way everybody else in this room does. You know, they're more spiritual. Someone else could sit in this room and say, they don't have Jesus the way I do. I'm more spiritual. You know what I mean? They can be, you know, it doesn't matter. It's all a mess. You know, it's all religious. It's all trying to, trying to uh, be something or be humble and admit something that isn't true. And here's what I mean by that. Jesus is already in you full and complete. Your lack is looking into the Father's eyes and from his eyes looking into his heart and seeing how he treats you when, when it's an issue of his son. He treats you as Jesus. Not that you're Jesus or I'm Jesus. We're not Jesus. We're vessels. But by the new birth, we have Jesus in us. And that's why Paul spent so much of his time um, praying that um, God would reveal his son in us. That, I, you know, like in Galatians 4.19, I travail in birth. This is, this is a, a, an urgent thing to Paul. You know, we go, oh, don't get so worked up. <laughs> Paul's going, I'm travailing in birth. Now, you guys may not get that, but anyone that's, you know what I mean, any girl here that's done that knows it's like, ah, you know. I mean, I remember sitting in the waiting room, and they carried Deb in, and she, and she is screaming. You can hear it down the halls. This is the absolute truth. She is screaming. And, and there's several guys in there because their wives are having babies, you know. And I said, don't worry, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so if I, if I, just my experience, if I take that, and I apply that to Paul, he is screaming, I want, I want Christ formed in you. You see the, the, you know, I mean, somebody could just go in there and go, oh, and then plop, the kid comes out. But, that, but that's not what Paul's talking to me. <laughs> that's not what, but, yeah, yeah. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about an incredible um, thing that has got hold of you that you want, because, you know, it's not like, I mean, there's several ways of looking at this. You could say, oh, Paul had a passion that Christ be formed in us, right? We could say that. Paul has a passion. Okay, but travail is not just a passion. It's not just, oh, I just really, you know, I want to have this baby. Ah! <laughs> no, it's something gets hold of you at a certain juncture where you, you're supposed to push. Randy, why are you so pushy about this? Because <laughs> I feel the travail. Because I want to see Christ coming out of all of us. Because I don't, I don't care if the church is successful or not. I don't care how well everybody's doing. I care that cr this baby comes out of everybody. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> whether others are, I am okay with that. And I will spend my life in that travail. Um, and so, um, so they are sons. They are in the family. <clears throat> and, and can I say it like this? They are in oneness already. They just don't know it. Okay, in fact, I had a statement here somewhere. Um, Uh, 
when the prodigal son left, well, when the prodigal son was not prodigal, he was just a son, and then when he left, and then when things went bad, and then when he came back, and then when he ate of the fatty calf, through every ounce of that, the son was already in him. Is that cool or what? And I'm not talking about the Jesus Savior Son. I'm talking about the Son of the Father's love. Ooh, the Son of the Father's love. God, that's, see, that's what the Father and the Son, you know, we can't know that unless, unless you're a prodigal and you don't know it and you really don't know it and then you come home and he starts treating you like Jesus and you go, what? I, I don't desire, I'm not worthy of this. And he goes, I know, this has nothing to do with you. I'm not doing this to you because you're worthy. So shut up and accept it. No, he would never say that. He would, he would say, cursed are you. <laughs> 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 you are an anathema if you receive any other gospel. But anyway. So, <clears throat> I mean, geez, that's just, that's just verse 11. And he said a certain man had two sons. Does that sound like there's a lot in there? Does that sound like if we understand that they are sons and this certain man is a father and this father made sure that we had the right seed in us <clears throat> and because of the father's faithfulness to his son, you can have assurance instead of striving for something that's already true. Now, there, there are applications. You know that. The, the story says that, you know, there had to be a transition in the son. But it was only a transition of, of, not, of un, not just understanding, not just teaching, not just doctrine. There had to be a transition from his mental view of what he thought everything was like to the father, not the father's mental view the father's heart view of his son in that vessel and together they were already one. Now the story, the story here is a story of oneness and it's a story of oneness on two, well, at least two different levels. It is, it would have been appropriate for me to say this is, a, uh, there we go, it's a story of oneness and she holds up one, I have one minute left. <clears throat> It's a story that's about to be over is what this is, <laughs> what, what, we're, what we're dealing with here. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll just make this statement and then, um, and that is, it's a story of oneness, but see, we always, here's the thing. I mean, oneness, I, I believe in oneness. I believe it's one of the most powerful, it, I believe it is the most powerful thing that we could embrace. It, that's my personal thing. <clears throat> um, but we always make it first about us. But this story shows it's a story of oneness between the father and his son. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And I'm not talking about the prodigal son, I'm talking about the father and the son that's in the prodigal son, that Jesus, the Lamb of God. That's oneness number one. And then oneness number two is that the son, the prodigal son quit being a prodigal, quit thinking like a prodigal, quit living separate, quit talking separate, quit accepting thoughts of separate, quit, you know, all of that junk and receive the view of the Father's heart. Okay, so that's, that's more than just a teaching. That is to receive something, an impartation of the Father's heart. So I'm just going to pray a quick prayer, okay, and then we'll stop and then we'll start. Back. Father, we do not want teaching. We do not just want to hang around the truths that we've been taught we want to press past all of that multitude and we want to get to you, Jesus. 
And we want to see you the way the Father sees you. And we want to see you in us the way the Father sees you. So Holy Spirit, make it so by grace, by your mercies. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, break time.